dedication and dedicatory letter in portrait of a man with red hair a romantic macabre this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. recording by david wales portrait of a man with red hair a romantic macabre by hugh walpole dedication and dedicatory letter to my friends ethel and arthur fowler dedicatory letter brackenburn april nineteen twenty five dear ethel and arthur it is appropriate in a way that i should give you this book when so much of it was written under your roof it is a romance and this has not been during the last twenty years a favourable time for romances but i'd like to give it to you because you know how it was written in a very happy summer after a long and arduous lecture tour during which more than ever before i learned to love your country i wrote it as a rest and a refreshment and i will tell you frankly that i have enjoyed writing it very much but i do not know whether in these stern days stories are intended to be enjoyed either by the writer of them or the reader i have noticed sometimes that people speak rather scornfully of a story as uh, readable but if it be not first of all readable what afterwards can it be surely dead before it is born i hope then and i believe that this tale is readable at least i know no more than that what it is fancy story allegory what you will i might invoke the great names of hoffman and hawthorne for its godfathers i might recall a story much beloved by me centrum and his companions did i not most justly fear the comparison but the word allegory is in these days a dangerous one and some one will soon be showing me that we have each one of us his sea fog his white tower and that it is the fault of his own weakness if he does not fling out of the windows his red-haired man no no god forbid this is a tale and nothing but a tale and all i ask is that once beginning it you will find it hard to lay down unfinished and that you will think of me always as your affectionate friend hugh within these few restrictions i think every writer may be permitted to deal as much in the wonderful as he pleases nay if he then keeps within the rules of credibility the more he can surprise the reader the more he will engage his attention and the more he will charm him as a genius of the highest rank observes in his fifth chapter of the bathos the great art of all poetry is to mix truth with fiction in order to join the credible with the surprising for though every good author will confine himself within the bounds of probability it is by no means necessary that his characters or his incidents should be trite common or vulgar such as happen in every street or in every house or which may be met with in the home articles of a newspaper nor must he be inhibited from showing many persons and things which may possibly never have fallen within the knowledge of a great part of his readers henry fielding end of dedication and dedicatory letter part one of portrait of a man with red hair by hugh walpole this librivox recording is in the public domain part one the sea like bronze section one one you're my friend i was the man the duke spoke to i helped the duchess to cast off his yoke too so here's the tale from beginning to end my friend two ours is a great wild country if you climb to our castle's top i don't see where your eye can stop for when you've passed the cornfield country where vineyards leave off flocks are packed and sheep range leads to cattle tract and cattle tract to open chase and open chase to the very base of the mountains where at a funeral pace round about solemn and slow one by one row after row up and up the pine-trees grow go like black priests up 
and so down the other side again to another greater wilder country to another greater wilder country to another greater one the soul of charles percy harkness slipped like a neat white pocket handkerchief out through the carriage window into the silver blue air hung there changing into a tiny white fleck against the immensity struggling for escape above the purple pointed trees of the dark wood then realizing that escape was not yet fluttered back into the carriage again was caught by charles percy neatly folded up and put away the browning lines old-fashioned surely had yielded it a moment's hope those and some other lines from another outmoded book but the place reasserted its spell marshalling once again its army its silver-belted knights its castles of perilous frowning darkness its meadows of gold and silver streams the old spell working the same purpose for how many times and for what intent that we may be reminded yet once again that there is the step behind the door the light beyond the window the rustle on the stair and that it is for these things only that we must watch and wait for harkness had committed the folly of having two books open on his knee a peck at one a peck at another a long eager glance through the window at the summer scene but above all a sensuous state of slumber hovering in the hot scented afternoon air just above him waiting to pounce to pounce first browning then this other the old book in a faded red-brown cover to paradise frederick lester at the bottom of the title page eighteen ninety two how long ago how faded and pathetic the old book was he alone in all the british isles at that moment reading it certainly no other living soul and he had crossed to browning after lester's third page he swung in mid-air the open fields came swimming up to him like vast green waves gently to splash upon his face hanging over him laced about the telegraph poles rising and falling with them the voice of the old man with the long white beard the only occupant of the carriage with him broke sharply in like a steel knife cutting through blotting paper uh, pardon me but there is a spider on your neck harkness started up the two books slipped to the floor he passed his hand damp with the afternoon warmth over his cool neck he hated spiders he shivered his fingers were on the thing with a shudder he flung it out of the window thank you he said blushing very slightly not at all the old man said severely you were almost asleep and in another moment it would have been down your back he was not the old man you would have expected to see in an english first-class carriage save that now in these democratic days you may see any one anywhere but first-class fares are so expensive perhaps that is why it is only the really poor who can afford them the old man who was thin and wiry had large shabby boots loose and ancient trousers a flopping garden straw hat his hands were gnarled like the knots of trees he was terribly clean he had blue eyes on his knees was a large basket and from this he ate his massive luncheon here an immense sandwich with pieces of ham like fragments of banners there a colossal apple a monstrous pear going far munched the old man no said harkness blushing again to trellis i change at Turth, i believe we should be there at four thirty should be said the old man dribbling through his pear the train's late another tourist he added suddenly i beg your pardon said harkness another of these damned tourists you are i mean i lived at trellis such as you drove me away i am sorry said harkness smiling faintly 
i suppose i am that if by tourist you mean somebody who is travelling to a place to see what it is like and enjoy its beauty a friend has told me of it he says it is the most beautiful place in england beauty said the old man licking his fingers a lot you tourists think about beauty with your charabangs and oranges and babies and americans if i had my way i'd make the americans pay a tax spoiling our country as they do i am an american said harkness faintly the old man licked his thumb looked at it and licked it again i wouldn't have thought it he said where's your accent i have lived in this country a great many years off and on he explained and we don't all say i guess every moment as novelists make us do he added smiling smiling yes but how deeply he detested this unfortunate conversation how happy he had been and now this old man with his rudeness and violence had smashed the piece into a thousand fragments but the old man spoke little more he only stared at harkness out of his blue eyes said trellis is too beautiful a place for you it will do you harm and fell instantly asleep two yes harkness thought looking at the rise and fall of the old man's beard it is strange and indeed lamentable how deeply i detest a cross word that is why i am always creeping away from things why too i never make friends not real friends why at thirty-five i am a complete failure that is from the point of view of anything real i am filled too with self-pity he added as he opened to paradise again and groped for page four and self-pity is the most despicable of all the vices he was not unpleasing to the eye as he sat there thinking he was dressed with exceeding neatness but his clothes had something of the effect of chain armour was that partly because his figure was so slight that he could never fill any suit of clothes adequately that might be so his soft white collar his pale blue tie his mild blue eyes his long tranquil fingers these things were all gentle his chin protruded he was called gaunt by undiscerning friends but that was a poor word for him he was too slight for that too gentle too unobtrusive his hair was already retreating deprecatingly from his forehead no gaunt man would smile so timidly his neatness and immaculate spotless purity of dress showed a fastidiousness that granted his cowardice an excuse for i am a coward he thought this is yet another holiday that i am taking alone alone after all these years and pritchard or mason major stock or henry trenchard carstairs willing or falk brandon any one of these might have wished to go if i'd had courage or even meredith himself might have come the only companions he reflected that he had taken with him on this journey were his etchings kinder to him more intimate with him rewarding him with more affection than any human being his seven etchings the seven of his forty la pierre's rue de la gilles le gros cabane dans les marais rembrandt's flight into egypt muirhead bones orvieto whistler's drury lane strang's a portrait of himself etching and marion's rue des chantres his seven etchings his greatest friends in the world save of course hetty and jane his sisters yes he reflected you can judge a man by his friends and in my cowardice i have given all my heart to these things because they can't answer me back cannot fail me when i most eagerly expect something of them are always there when i call them do not change nor betray me and yet it is not only cowardice they are intimate and individual as no other form of graphic art they are so personal that every separate impression has a fresh character they are so lovely in soul that they never age nor have their moods my aldegrives and puns he was reflecting 
he was a little happier now the browning and to paradise fell once more to the ground i hope the old man does not waken he thought and yet perhaps he will pass his station what a temper he will be in if he does that and then i too shall suffer he read a line or two of the browning ours is a great wild country if you climb to our castle's top i don't see where your eye can stop how strange that the book should have opened again at that same place as though it were there that it wished him to read and then to paradise a line or two now page three seventy six and the silver button would his answer defy that too had he some secret magic was he stronger than god himself and then harkness reflected this business about being an american he had felt pride when he had told the old man that that was his citizenship he was proud yes and yet he spent most of his life in europe and now as always when he fell to thinking of america his eye travelled to his own home there baker at the portals of oregon all the big trains pass it on their way to the coast three hundred and forty miles from portland fifty from huntington he saw himself on that eager arrival coming out by the eleven thirty train from salt lake city steaming in at four thirty in the afternoon an early may afternoon perhaps with the colors violet in the sky and the mountains elephant dusk so quiet and so gentle and when the train has gone on and you are left on the platform and you look about you and find everything as it was when you departed a year ago the columbia cafe the antlers hotel the mountains still with their snow caps the lumber offices the notice on the wall of the cafe you can eat here if you have no money the crab bill hotel the fresh sweet air three thousand five hundred feet up the soft paws of the place baker did not grow very fast as did other places it was true that there had been but four houses when his father had first landed there but even now as towns went it was small and quiet and unprogressive strange that his father with that old cultured new england stock should have gone there but he had fled from mankind after the death of his wife harkness mother fled with his three little children shut himself away there under the mountains with his books a sad severe man in that long rambling ramshackle house still long still rambling still ramshackle although hetty and jane who never moved away from it had made it as charming as they could they were darlings and lived for the month every year when their brother came to visit them but he could not live there no he could not it was exile for him exile from everything for which he most deeply cared but europe was exile too that was the tragedy of it every morning that he waked he thought that perhaps to-day he would find that he was a true european but no it was not so away from america how deeply he loved his country how clearly he saw its idealism its vitality its marvellous promise for the future its loving contact with his own youthful dreams but back in america again it seemed crude and noisy and materialistic he longed for the past exile in both with his new england culture that was not enough his half-cocked vitality that was not enough never enough to permit his half-gods to go but he loved america always he saw how little these europeans truly knew or cared about her how hasty their visits to her how patronizing their attitude how weary their stale conventions against her full bursting energy and yet and yet he could not live there after two weeks of baker even though he had with him his etchings his diary in its dark blue cover fraser's golden bow and some of the loeb classics life was not enough hetty and jane bored him with their goodness and little culture club 
it was not enough for him that hetty had read a very good paper on archibald marshall the modern trollop to the inhabitants of baker and haynes nevertheless they seemed to him a finer women than the women of any other country with their cheery independence their admirable common sense their warm hearts their unselfishness but it was not enough no it was not enough what he wanted three the old man awoke with a start and when you come to this prohibition question he said the americans have simply become a laughing-stock harkness picked up the browning firmly if you don't mind he remarked i have a piece of work here of some importance and i have but little time pray excuse me four how had he dared never in all his life had he spoken to a stranger so how often had he envied and admired those who could be rude and indifferent to people's feelings it seemed to him that this was a crisis with him something that he would never forget something that might alter all his life perhaps already the charm of which meredith had spoken was working he looked out of his window and always afterwards he was to remember a stream that now bright silver now ebony dark ran straight to him from the heart of an emerald green field like a greeting spirit it laughed up to his window and was gone he had asserted himself the old man with the beard was reading the hibbert journal strange old man but defeated harkness felt a triumph could he but henceforward assert himself in this fashion all might be easy for him instead of retreating he might advance stretch out his hand and take the things and people that he wanted as he had seen others do he almost wished that the old man might speak to him again that he might once more be rude he had had ever since he could remember the belief that one day suddenly some magic door would open some one step before him some magic carpet unroll at his feet and all life would be changed for many years he had had no doubt of this he would call it perhaps the coming of romance but as he had grown older he had come to distrust both himself and life he had always been interested in contemporary literature every new book that he opened now seemed to tell him that he was extremely foolish to expect anything of life at all he was swallowed by the modern realistic movement as a fly is swallowed by an indifferent spider these men he said to himself are very clever they know so much more about everything than i do that they must be right they are telling the truth at last about life as no one has ever done it before but when he had read a great many of these books and every word of mr joyce's ulysses he found that he cared much less about truth than he had supposed he even doubted whether these writers were telling the truth any more than the naive and sentimental victorians and when at last he read a story all about an american manufacturer of washing machines whose habit it was to strip himself naked on every possible occasion before his nearest and dearest relations and friends and when the author told him that this was a typical american citizen he knowing his own country people very well frankly disbelieved it these realists he exclaimed are telling fairy stories quite as thoroughly as grimm fouque and de la mer the difference is that the realistic fairy stories are depressing and discouraging the others are not he determined to desert the realists and wait until something pleasanter came along since it was impossible to have the truth about life anyway let us have only the pleasant hallucinations they are quite as likely to be as true as the others but he was lonely and desolate the women whom he loved never loved him and indeed he never came sufficiently close to them to give them any encouragement he dreamt about them and painted them as they certainly were not he had his passions and his desires but his puritan descent kept him always at one remove from experience 
he never in fact seemed to have contact with anything at all except baker in oregon his two sisters and his forty etchings he was so shy that he was thought to be conceited so idealistic that he was considered cynical so chaste that he was considered a most immoral fellow with a secret double life like the hero of flagelyara he loved every dog and wanted every dog to love him but the dogs did not know enough about him to be interested he was so like so many other immaculately dressed pleasant-mannered and wandering american cosmopolitans that nobody had any permanent feeling for him fathered by henry james uncled by howells haunted severely by edith wharton one of a million cultured kindly impersonal americans seen as shadows by the matter-of-fact unimaginative british who knew or cared that he was lonely longing for love for home for some one to whom he might give his romantic devotion he was all these things but no one minded and then he met james meredith five the meeting was of the simplest at the reform club one day he was lunching with two men one a novelist westcott whom he knew very slightly the other a fellow american westcott a dark thick-set man of about forty with a reputation that without being sensational was solid and well merited said very little harkness liked him and recognized in him a kindly shyness rather like his own after luncheon they moved into the big smoking-room upstairs to drink their coffee a large handsome man of between fifty and sixty came up and spoke to westcott he was obviously pleased to see him putting his hand on his shoulder looking at him with kindly smiling eyes westcott also flushed with pleasure the big man sat down with them and harkness was introduced to him his name was meredith sir james meredith a strange unreal kind of name for so real and solid a man as he sat forward on the sofa with his heavy shoulders his deep chest his thick neck red-brown colour and clear open gaze he seemed to harkness to be the typical rather naive friendly but cautious british man of business that impression soon passed there was something in meredith that almost instantly warmed his heart he responded as to all american men immediately even emotionally to any friendly contact the reserves that were in his nature were from his superficial cosmopolitanism the native warm-hearted eager and trusting american was as real and active as it ever had been it was in five minutes as though he had known this large friendly man always his shyness dropped from him he was talking eagerly and with great happiness meredith did not patronize did not check that american spontaneity with traditional caution as so many englishmen do he seemed to like harkness as truly as harkness liked him westcott had to go the other american also departed but meredith and harkness sat on there amused and even absorbed if i'm keeping you harkness said suddenly some of his shyness for a moment returning Oh, not at all meredith answered i have nothing urgent this afternoon i've got the very place for you i believe they had been speaking of places meredith had travelled and together they found some of the smaller places that they both knew and loved Dragur, on the sea beyond copenhagen the woods north of helsingfors the beaches of ischia the enchantment of hirhente with the white ghosts moving over carpets of flowers through the ruined temples the silence and mystery of mull he knew america too the places that foreigners never knew the teeth-shaped mountains at las cruces the lovely curve of tacoma the little humped-up hills of syracuse the purple horizons beyond nashville the lone lake shore of marquette and then in this country there is trellis he said softly staring in front of him trellis harkness repeated after him liking the name 
yes in north cornwall a beautiful place he paused sighed i was there more than ten years ago i shall never go back why not oh, i liked it too well i dare say they spoiled it now as they have many others thanks to wretched novelists the railway company and charabanks cornwall and glebeshire are ruined no i dare not go back was it very beautiful harkness asked yes beautiful oh, beautiful oh yes wonderful but it wasn't that something happened to me there so that you dare not go back yes dare is the word i believe that the same thing would happen again and i'm too old to stand it in my case now it would be ludicrous it was nearly ludicrous then harkness said nothing how old are you if it isn't an impertinence thirty-five you're young enough i was forty have you ever noticed about places he broke off i mean well you know with people suppose that you have been very intimate with someone and then you don't see him or her for years and then you meet again don't you find yourself suddenly producing the same set of thoughts emotions moods that have perhaps lain dormant for years and that only this one person can call from you and it is the same with places sometimes of course in the interval something has died in you or in them and the second meeting produces nothing hands cross over a grave but if those things haven't died how wonderful to find them all alive again after all these years how you had forgotten the way they breathed and spoke and had their being how interesting to find yourself drawn back again into that old current perilous perhaps but deep real after all the shams he broke off places do the same i think he said if you have the sort of things in you that stir them they produce in their turn their things and always will for your kind a sort of secret society i believe he added suddenly turning on harkness and looking him in the face that trellis might give you something of the same adventure that it gave me if you want it to that is if you need it do you want adventure romance something that will pull you right out of yourself and test you show you whether you are real or no give you a crisis that will change you forever do you want it then he added quietly reflectively it changed me more than the war ever did do i want it harkness was breathing deeply driven by some excitement that he could not stop to analyze i should say so i want nothing so much it's just what i need what i've been looking for then go down there i believe you're just the kind but go at the right time there's a night in august when they have a dance when they dance all around the town that's the time for you to go that will liberate you if you throw yourself into it it's in august uh, august the um, i'm not quite sure of the date i'll write to you if you'll give me your address soon afterwards with a warm clasp of the hand they parted six two days later harkness received a small parcel opening it he discovered an old brown covered book and a letter the letter was as follows dear mr harkness in all probability in the cold light of reason and removed from the fumes of the reform club our conversation of yesterday will seem to you nothing but foolishness perhaps it was the merest chance led me to think of something that belongs for me to a life quite dead and gone not perhaps as dead though as i had fancied in any case i had not until yesterday thought directly of trellis for years let me put it on the simplest ground if you want a beautiful place near at hand for a holiday that you have not yet seen here it is trellis north cornwall take the morning train from paddington and change it truth if you will be advised by me you really should go down for august sixth when they have their dance i could see that you are interested in local customs and here is a most entertaining one surviving from druid times i believe go down on the day itself 
and let that be your first impression of the place the train gets you in between five and six take your room at the man-at-arms hotel ten years ago the most picturesque inn in great britain i cannot of course vouch for what it may have become i should get out at truth which you will reach soon after four and walk the three miles to the town well worth doing one word more i am sending you a book a completely forgotten novel by a completely forgotten novelist had he lived he would i think have done work that would have lasted but he was killed in the first year of the war and his earlier books are uncertain he hadn't found himself this book as you will see from the inscription he gave me i was with him down there some things in it seem to me to belong especially to the place pages 102 and 236 will show you especially what i mean when you are at the man-at-arms go and look at the minstrels gallery if it isn't pulled down or turned into a jazz dancing hall that too will show you what i mean or go as perhaps after all is wiser simply to a beautiful place for a week's holiday forgetting me and anything i have said or as is perhaps wiser still don't go at all in any case i am your debtor for our delightful conversation of yesterday sincerely yours james meredith what meredith had said occurred as the days passed the impression faded harkness hoped that he would meet meredith again he did not do so during the first days he watched for him in the streets and in the clubs he devised plans that would give him an excuse to meet him once more the simplest of all would have been to invite him to luncheon he knew that meredith would come but his own distrust of himself now as always forbade him why should meredith wish to see him again he had been pleasant to him yes he was of the type that would be agreeable to any one kindly genial and forgetting you immediately but meredith had not forgotten him he had taken the trouble to write to him and send him a book it had been a friendly letter too why not ask westcott and meredith to dinner but westcott was married harkness had met his wife a charming and pretty english girl younger a good deal than her husband yes all right about mrs westcott but then harkness must ask another woman meredith he understood was a widower the thing was becoming a party they would have to go somewhere to a theater or something the thing was becoming elaborate complicated and he shrank from it so he always shrank from everything were he given time to think he paid all the gentle american courtesy and attention to fine details of conduct englishmen often shocked him by their casual inattention especially to ladies he must do social things elaborately did he do them at all he was gathering around him already some of the fussy observances of the confirmed bachelor and therefore as meredith became to him something of a problem he put him out of his mind just as he had put so many other things and persons out of his mind because he was frightened of them trellis too as the days passed lost some of the first magic of its name he had felt a strange excitement when meredith had first mentioned it but soon it was the name of a beautiful but distant place then a seaside resort then nowhere at all he did not read lester's book then an odd thing occurred it was the last day in july and he was still in london nearly every one had gone away every one whom he knew there were still many millions of human beings on every side of him but london was empty for himself and his kind his club was closed for cleaning purposes and the reform club was offering him and his fellow clubmen temporary hospitality he had lunched alone then had gone upstairs sunk into an armchair and read a newspaper read it or seemed to read it it was time that he went away where should he go there was an uncle who had taken a shooting box in scotland he did not like that uncle he had an invitation from a kind lady who had a large house in wiltshire 
but the kind lady had asked him because she pitied him, not because she liked him. He knew that very well. There were several men who would, if he had caught them sooner, have gone with him somewhere, but he had allowed things to drift, and now they had made their own plans. He felt terribly lonely, soused suddenly with that despicable self-pity to which he was rather too easily prone. He thought of Baker. Lord, how hot it must be there just now. He was half asleep. It was hot enough here. Only one other occupant of the room, and he was fast asleep in another armchair, snoring. The room rocked with his snores. The papers, laid neatly one upon another, wilted under the heat. The subdued London roar came from behind the windows in rolling waves of heat. A faint iridescence hovered above the enormous chairs and sofas that lay like animals panting. He looked across the long room. Almost opposite him was a square of wall that caught the subdued light like a pool of water. He stared at it as though it had demanded his attention. The water seemed to move, to shift. Something was stirring there. He looked more intently. Colors came, shapes shifted. It was a scene, some place. Yes, a place. Houses, sand, water, a bay, a curving bay, a long sea line, dark like the stroke of a pencil against faint eggshell blue water a bay bordered by a ring of saffron sand and behind the sand rising above it a town tier on tier of houses and behind them again in the farthest distance a fringe of dark wood he could even see now little figures black spots dotted upon the sand the sea now was very clear shimmering mother of pearl a scattering of white upon the shore as the long wave line broke and retreated and the houses tier upon tier he gazed filled with an overwhelming breathless excitement he was leaning forward his hands pressing in upon the arms of the chair it stayed trembling with a kind of personal invitation before him then as though it had nodded and smiled farewell to him it vanished only the wall was there but the excitement remained excitement quite unaccountable he got up his knees trembling he looked at the stout bellying occupant of the other chair his mouth open his snores reverberant he went out six days later he was in the train for trellis seven now too of course he had his reactions just as he always had he could explain the thing easily enough for a moment or two he had slept or if he had not a trick of light on that warm afternoon and his own thoughts about possible places had persuaded him nevertheless the picture remained strangely vivid the sea the shore the rising town the little line of darkening wood he would go down there, and on the day that Meredith had suggested to him. Something might occur. He never could tell. He packed his etchings, his saint Giles, Marais, his flight into Egypt and Orvieto, his Whistler and Strang and Marion. They would protect him and see that he did nothing foolish. He had special confidence in his saint Giles. He had intended to read the Lester book all the way, but, as we have seen, managed only a bare line or two. The browning he had not intended even to have with him, but in some fashion, with the determined resolve that books so often show, it had crept into his bag, and then was on his knee, he knew not whence, and soon, out of self-defence against the old man, he was reading The Flight of the Duchess, carried away on the wings of its freedom, strength, and colour nevertheless that is the kind of man i am he thought even the books force me to read them when i have no wish and soon he had forgotten the old man the carriage the warm weather how many years since he had read it no matter wasn't it fine and touching and true when he came to the place 
the door opened and more than mortal stood with a face where to my mind centred all beauties i ever saw or shall see the duchess i stopped as if struck by palsy she was so different happy and beautiful i felt at once that all was best and that i had nothing to do for the rest but wait her commands obey and be dutiful not that in fact there was any commanding i saw the glory of her eye and the brow's height and the breast expanding and i was hers to live or to die hurrah harkness cried i beg your pardon the old man said looking up harkness blushed i was reading something rather fine he said smiling you'd better look out for what you're reading to whom you're speaking where you're walking what you're eating everything when you're in trellis he remarked why is it so dangerous a place asked harkness it doesn't like tourists i've seen it do funny things to tourists in my time i think you're hard on tourists harkness said they don't mean any harm they admire places the best way they can yes and how long do they stay the old man replied do you think you can know a place in a week or a month do you think a real place likes the dirt and the noise and the silly talk they bring with them what do you mean by a real place harkness asked places have souls just like people some have more soul and some have less and some have none at all sometimes a place will creep away altogether it is so disgusted with the things people are trying to do to it and will leave a dummy instead and only a few know the difference why up in the welsh hills there are several places that have gone up there in sheer disgust the way they've been treated and left substitutes behind them parts of london for instance do you think that's the real chelsea you see in london not a bit of it the real chelsea is living well i mustn't tell you where it is living but you'll never find it however americans are the last to understand these things i am wasting my breath talking the train had drawn now into drymouth the old man was silent looking out at the hurrying crowds on the platform he was certainly a pessimist and a hater of his kind he was looking out at the innocent people with a lowering brow as though he would slaughter the lot of them had he the power old testament moses harkness named him after a while the train slowly moved on they passed above the mean streets the hoardings with the cheap theatres the lines with the clothes hanging in the wind the grimy windows but even these things the lovely sky shining transmuted they came to the river it lay on either side of the track a broad sheet of lovely water spreading on the left to the open sea the warships clustered in dark ebony shadows against the gold the hills rose softly bending in kindly peace and happy watchfulness silence we're crossing the old man cried he was sitting forward his gnarled hands on his broad knees staring in front of him the train drew in to a small wayside station gay with flowers the trees blew about it in whispering clusters the old man got up gathered his basket and lumbered out neither looking at nor speaking to harkness he was alone he felt an overwhelming relief he had not liked the old man and very obviously the old man had not liked him but it was not only that he was alone that pleased him there was something more than that it was indeed as though he were in a new country the train seemed to be going now more slowly with a more casual air as though it too felt a relief and did not care what happened time engagement schedules all these were now forgotten as they went comfortably lumbering the curving fields embracing them the streams singing to them the little houses perched on the clear-lit skyline smiling down upon them it would not be long now before they were in truth where he must change he took his two books and put them away in his bag should he send the bag on and walk as meredith had advised him three miles not far and it was a most lovely day 
he could smell the sea now through the windows it must be only over that ridge of hill he was strangely oddly happy london seemed far far away america too any country that had a name a date a history this country was timeless and without a record how beautifully the hills dipped into valleys streams seemed to be everywhere little secret colored streams with happy thoughts everything and every one surely here was happy then suddenly he saw a deserted mine tower like a gaunt and ruined temple haggard and fierce it stood against the skyline and as harkness looked back to it it seemed to raise an arm to heaven in desperate protest the train drew into truth eight truth was nothing more than a long wooden platform open to all the winds of heaven and behind it a sort of shed with a ticket collector's box in one side of it harkness was annoyed to see that others beside himself climbed out and scattered about the platform waiting for the trueless train to come in he resented these especially because they were grand and elegant two men long thin in baggy knickerbockers carrying themselves as though all the world belonged to them with that indifferent assurance that only englishmen have a large stout woman quietly but admirably dressed with a pekingese and a maid to whom she spoke as cleopatra to charmian five boxes gun cases magnificent golf bags these things were scattered about the naked bare platform the wind came in from the sea and sported everywhere flipping at the stout lady's skirts laughing at the elegant sportsman's thin calves mocking at the pouting pekingese it was fresh and lovely all the cornfields were waving invitation it was characteristic of harkness that a fancied haughty glance from the sportsman's eye decided him he's laughing at my clothes harkness thought how was it that englishmen wore old things so carelessly and yet were never wrong harkness bought his clothes from the best london tailors but they were always finally a little hostile they never surrendered to his personality keeping their own proud reserve i'll walk he thought suddenly he found a young porter who in anxious fashion so unlike american porters who were always so superior to the luggage that they conveyed was wheeling magnificent trunks on a very insecure barrel these two boxes of mine harkness said stopping him i want to walk over to trellis can they be sent over happen they can said the young porter doubtfully they are labelled to the man-at-arms hotel harkness said they'll be there as soon as you will said the young porter cheered at the sight of an american tip which he put in his pocket thinking in his heart that these foreigners were damn fools to throw their money around as they did he advanced towards the stout lady hopefully she might also prove to be american harkness plunged out of the station into the broad white road a sign pointed trellis three miles so meredith had been exactly right as he left the village behind him and strode on between the cornfields he felt a marvellous freedom he was heading now directly for the sea the salt tang of it struck him in the face larks were circling in the blue air above him poppies scattered the corn with splashes of crimson here and there gaunt rocks rose from the heart of the gold no human being was in sight his love of etching had given him something of an etcher's eye and he saw here a spreading tree and a pool of dark shadow there a distant spire on the curving hill that he thought would have caught the fancy of his beloved le pere or le gros here a wayside pool like brittle glass that would have enchanted appin there a cottage with a sweeping field that might have made rembrandt happy he seemed to be in unison with the whole of nature and when the road left the fields and dived into the heart of a common his happiness was complete he stood there his feet pressing in upon the rough springing turf 
a lark singing above him came down as though welcoming him then circled up and up and up he raised his head, stared into the pale, faint blue, until he seemed himself to circle with the bird, the turf pressing him upwards, his hands lifting him, he swinging into spaceless ecstasy. Then his gaze fell again and swung out beyond, and there was the sea. The down ran in a green wave to the blue line of the sky, but in front of him it split, breaking into brown rocky patches, and between the brown curves a pool of purple sea lay like water in a cup. He walked forward, deserting for a moment the road. He stood at the edge of the cliff and looked down. The tide was high, and the line of the sea slipped up to the feet of the cliff, splashing there its white fringe of spray, then very gently fell back. Sea pinks starred the cliffs with color. Sea gulls whirled, fragments of white foam against the blue. Just below him one bird sat, its head cocked, waiting. With a shrill cry of vigor and assurance, it flashed away, curving, circling, bending, dipping, as though it were showing to Harkness what it could do. He walked along the cliff path, happier than he had been for many, many months. This was enough, were there no more than this. For this, at least, he must thank Meredith, this peace, this air, this silence. Turning a bend of the cliff, he saw the town. 9. It was absolutely the town of his vision. He saw, with a strange tightening of his heart, as though he were being warned of something, that that was so. There was the curving bay with the faint fringe of white penciling the yellow sand, there the houses rising tier on tier above the beach, there the fringe of dusky wood. What did it mean? Why had he a clutch of terror, as though someone was whispering to him that he must turn tail and run? Nothing could be more lovely than that town basking in the mellow afternoon light, and yet he was afraid at the sight of it afraid so that his content and happiness of a moment ago were all gone and of a sudden he longed for company he was so well accustomed to his own reactions and so deeply despised them that he shrugged his shoulders and walked forward never it seemed was it possible for him to enjoy anything for more than a moment trouble and regret always came but this was not regret, it was rather a kind of forewarning. He did not know that he had ever before looked on a place for the first time with so odd a mingling of conviction that he had already seen it, of admiration for its beauty, and of some sort of alarmed dismay. Beautiful it was, more Italian than English, with its white walls, its purple sea, and warm scented air so peaceful and of so happy a tranquillity he tried to drive his fear from him but it hung on so that he was often turning back and looking behind him over his shoulder he struck the road again it curved now white and broad down the hill toward the town at the very peak of the hill before the descent began a man was standing watching something Harkness walked forward, then also stood still. The man was so deeply absorbed that his absorption held you. He was standing at the edge of the road, and Harkness must pass him. At the crunch of Harkness' step on the gravel of the road, the man turned and looked at him with startled surprise. Harkness had come across the soft turf of the down, and his sudden step must have been an alarm. The fellow was broad-shouldered, medium height, clean-shaven, tanned, young, under thirty at least, dressed in a suit of dark blue. He had something of a naval air. Harkness was passing when the man said, "'Have you the right time on you, sir?' His voice was fresh, pleasant, well-educated. Harkness looked at his watch. "'Quarter past five, he said. He was moving forward when the man hesitating, spoke again. 
Uh, you don't see anyone coming up the road? Harkness stared down the white, sun-bleached expanse. No, he said after a moment, I don't. They looked for a while, standing side by side, silently. After all, he wasn't more than a boy, not a day more than twenty-five, but with that grave, reserved look that so many British boys who were old enough to have been in the war had. Sure you don't see anybody? he asked again. Coming up that farther bend? No, said Harkness, shading his eyes with his hand against the sun. Can't say as I do. Damn nuisance, the boy said. He's half an hour late now. The boy stood as though to attention, his figure set, his hands at his side. Ah, there's someone, said Harkness, but it was only an old man with his cart. He slowly pressed up the hill past them, urging his horses with a thick guttural cry, an old man, brown as a berry. I beg your pardon, the boy turned to Harkness. You'll think it an awful impertinence, b but are you in a terrible hurry? No, said Harkness, not terrible. I want to be at the man-at-arms by dinner-time, that's all. Oh, you've got lots of time, the boy said eagerly. Look here. This is desperately important for me. The man ought to have been here half an hour ago. If he doesn't come in another twenty minutes, I don't know what I shall do. It's just occurred to me. There's another way up this hill, a shortcut. He may have chosen that. He may not have understood where it was that I wanted him to meet me. Would you mind, would you do me the favor of just standing here while I go over the hill there to see whether he's waiting on the other side? I won't be away more than five minutes. I'd be so awfully grateful. Why, of course, said Harkness. He's a fisherman with a black beard. You can't mistake him. And if he comes, if you just ask him to wait for a moment until I'm back. Certainly, said Harkness. Oh, thanks most awfully. Very decent of you, sir. The boy touched his cap, climbed the hill, and vanished. Harkness was alone again, not a sound anywhere. The town shimmered below him in the heat. He waited, absorbed by the picture spread in front of him, then apprehensive again and conscious that he was alone. The alarm that he had originally felt at sight of the town had not left him. Suppose the boy did not return. Was playing some joke on him, perhaps. No, whatever else it was, it was not that. The boy had been deeply serious, plunged into some kind of crisis that was of tremendous importance to him. Harkness decided that he would wait until the shadow of a solitary tree to his right reached him, and then go. The shadow crept slowly to his feet. At the same moment, a figure turned the bend, a man with a black beard. He was walking quickly up the hill, as though he knew that he were late. Harkness went forward to meet him. The man stopped as though surprised. "'I beg your pardon,' said Harkness. "'Were you expecting to meet someone here?' Oh, I, "'I was. Yes,' said the man. "'He will be back in a moment. He was afraid that you might have come up the other way.' He went over the hill to see. Aye, said the man, standing, his legs apart, quite unconcerned. He was a handsome fellow, broad-shouldered, wearing dark blue trousers and a knitted jersey. You'll be a friend of Mr. Dunbar's, maybe? No, I'm not, Harkness explained. I was passing, and he asked me to wait for a moment and catch you if you came while he was away. Aye, said the fisherman, taking out a large wedge of tobacco and filling his pipe. I'm a bit later than I said I'd be. Wife kept me. Fine evening, said Harkness. Aye, said the man. At that moment the boy came over the hill and joined them. Very good of you, sir, he said. You're late, Jabez. Good night, said Harkness, and moved down the hill. He could see the two in urgent conversation as he moved forward. The incident occupied his mind. Why had the matter seemed of such importance to the boy? Why a meeting so elaborately appointed out there on the hillside? The fisherman, too, had seemed surprised that he, a stranger, should be concerned in the matter. Had he been in America, the affair would have been at once explained. Bootlegging, of course. 
but here in england end of part one section one part one of portrait of a man with red hair by hugh walpole this librivox recording is in the public domain part one the sea like bronze section two ten when he reached the bottom of the hill he found that he was in the environs of the town he was walking now along a road shaded by thick trees and close to the seashore the cottages whitewash crooked and many of them thatched ran down to the road their gardens like little coloured carpets spreading in front of them the evening air was thick with the scent of flowers above all of roses he had never smelt such roses no not in california there was a breeze from the sea and it seemed to blow the roses into his very heart so that they seemed to be all about him dark crimson burning white scattering their petals over his head he could hear the tune of the sea upon the sand beyond the trees he stood for a moment inhaling the scent delicious wonderful he seemed to be crushing multitudes of the petals between his hands after a while the road broke away and he saw a path that led directly through the trees to the sea so soon as he had taken some steps across the soft sand he seemed to be alone in a world that was watching every movement that he made it was as though he were committing some intrusion he stopped and looked behind him the thin line of trees had retreated the cottages vanished before him was a waste of yellow sand the deep purple of the sea rose like a wall to his right hiding as it were some farther scene the sky stretching over it a pale blue curtain tightly held a mist was rising veiling the town no living person was in sight he reached a stretch of hard firm sand thin rivulets of water lacing it the air was wonderfully mild and sweet never before in his life had he known such a feeling of anticipation it was as though he knew the stretch of sand to be the last brook to cross before he would come into some mysterious country how commonplace this will all seem to me to-morrow he said to himself when over my eggs and bacon at a prosperous modern hotel i shall be reading my daily mail and hearing of the trippers at eastburn and who has taken shooting in scotland and whether yorkshire has beaten surrey at cricket he wanted to keep this moment not to enter the town even he had a mad impulse to walk on the sand for an hour to see the colour fade from the sky and the sea change to a ghostly grey then to return up the hill to truth and catch the night train back to london it would be wonderful like that to have only the impression of the walk from the station the talk with the boy on the hill the scent of the roses and the afternoon sky everything is destroyed if you go into it too closely or it is so for me i should have a memory that would last all my life but now the town was advancing towards him his steps made no sound so that it seemed that he himself stood still waiting to be seized he took one last look at the sea then he was caught up and the houses closed around him eleven six was striking from some distant clock as he started up the street at the bottom of the hill there were fishermen's cottages nets spread out on the stones to dry some boats drawn up above a wooden jetty then as the street spread out before him some little shops began figures were passing hither and thither all transmuted in the afternoon light meredith need not have feared he thought this town had not been touched at all as he advanced yet further the houses delighted him with their broad doorways their overhanging eaves crooked roof and worn flights of steps he came to a place where wooden stairs led to an upper path that ran before a higher row of houses and under the steps there were shops he could feel a stir and bustle in the place as though this were a night of festivity 
groups were gathered at corners women stood in doorways laughing and whispering a group of children was marching wearing cocked hats of paper beating on a wooden box and blowing on penny trumpets then on coming into the square he paused in sheer delighted wonder this stands on a raised plateau above the sea and the town hall solid and virtuous above its flight of wide grey steps is its great glory streets seemed to tumble in and out of the square on every side on a far corner there was a merry-go-round and there were booths and wooden trestles some tents and flags waving above them but just now it was almost deserted only a man or two some children playing in and out of the tents a dog hunting among the scraps of paper that littered the cobbles a church of norman architecture filled the right side of the square and squeezed between its grey walls and the modern town hall was a tall old tower of infinite age with thin slits of windows and iron bars that pushed out against the pale blue sky like pointing fingers there were houses in the square that were charming houses with queer bow windows and protruding doors like pepper pots little balconies and here and there old carved figures on the walls houses that whistler would have loved to etch harkness stopped a man can you tell me where i shall find the man-at-arms hotel he asked why yes the man answered as though he were surprised that harkness should not know straight up that street in front of you you'll find it at the top and he did find it at the top after what seemed to him an endless climb the houses fell away an iron gate was in front of him as though he were entering some private residence going up a long drive he passed beautiful lawns that shone like silk to the right the grass fell away to a pond fringed with trees flowers were around him on every side and again in his nostrils was the heavy scent of innumerable roses the drive swept a wide circle before the great eighteenth-century house that now confronted him but it is not a hotel at all he thought and he would have turned back had not at that moment a large hotel omnibus swept up to the door and discharged a chattering heap of men and women who scattered over the steps screaming about their luggage collecting children the spell was broken he had not realized how alone he had been during the last hour and with that domination his imagination had been working creating for him a world of his own encouraging in him what hopes fears and anticipations he slipped in after the rest and stood shyly in the hall while the others made their wants triumphantly felt a man of about forty stout and round like an egg but very shinily dressed came forward and bending and bowing smiled at the women and spoke deferentially to the men this must be mr bannister the king of the castle meredith had told him in the club not the original mr bannister who has made the place what it is he is alas dead and gone had he been still there and you had mentioned my name he would have done wonders for you i don't know this fellow and for all i know he may have ruined the place however the original bannister could not have been politer harkness was always afraid of hotel officials and it was only when the invasion had broken up and begun to scatter that he came forward but mr bannister knew all about him indeed was expecting him his luggage had already arrived he should be shown his room and mr bannister did hope that it would be oh if anything in the least wasn't harkness started upstairs there is a lift there but if the gentleman doesn't mind his room is only on the second floor and instead of waiting of course the gentleman doesn't mind and still less does he mind when he sees his room this is mine absolutely harkness said as though it had been waiting for me for years and years with its curved bow window its view over the enchanting garden and the line of sea beyond 
its white wall unbroken by those coloured prints that hotel managers in my own country find it so necessary always to provide those chintz curtains with the roses are delicious just enough furniture there is no private bath of course the bathroom is just across the passage very convenient said the man yes in england we haven't reached the private bathroom yet although we are supposed to be so fond of bathing no sir said the man anything else i can do for you no thank you said harkness smiling as he looked on the white sunlit walls and checking the tip that american fashion he was about to give how strong the smell of the roses it is very late for them isn't it they are just about over sir so i should have thought left alone he slowly unpacked he liked unpacking and putting things away it was packing that he detested he had a few things with him that he always carried when he travelled a red leather writing case a small japanese fisherman in coloured ivory two figures in red amber photographs of his sisters in a silver frame he put out these little things on a table of white wood near his bed not from any affectation but because when they were there the room seemed to understand him to settle about him with a little sigh as though it granted him citizenship for so long as he wished to stay then there were his prints he took out four the lepere st gilles strang's etcher the rembrandt flight into egypt and the whistler drury lane the strang he had on one side of the looking-glass the drury lane on the other the flight into egypt at the back of the writing-table whither he might glance across the room at it as he lay in bed the st giles close to him near to the red writing-case and the ivory fisherman he sighed with satisfaction as sitting down on his bed he looked at them he felt that he needed them to-night as he had never needed them before the sense of excited anticipation that had increased with him all day was now surely approaching its climax that excitement had in it the strangest mixture of delight sensuous thrill and something that was nothing but panicky terror yes he was frightened of what of whom he could not tell but only as he looked across the room at those familiar scenes at the massive dark tree of the st giles with the hot road the high comfortable hedge the happy figures at the adorable face of the donkey in the rembrandt at the little beings so marvellously placed under the dancing butterfly in the whistler at the strong homely friendly countenance of strang himself he felt as he had so often felt before that those beautiful things were trying themselves to reassure him to tell him that they did not change nor alter and that where he would be there they would be too he took meredith's letter from his pocket and read it again here he was now what must happen next he could dress now at once for dinner and then walk in the garden before the light began to fail or no wasn't he to go down into the town after dinner and to see this dance to share in it even hadn't meredith said that that was what above all else he must do and then what was this about a minstrel's gallery somewhere he would have a bath change his linen and then begin his explorations he undressed found the bathroom enjoyed himself for twenty minutes or more then slipped back across the passage into his room again it was now nearly seven o'clock as he was dressing the sun was setting low in the sky a beam of sunshine caught the intent gaze of strang who seemed to lean across his etching board as though to tell him to reassure him to warn him he slipped out of his room and began his explorations twelve for a while he wandered lost in a maze of passages he understood that the minstrel's gallery was at the top of the house he did not use the lift but climbed the stairs meeting no one then he was on a floor that must he thought be servants quarters 
it had another air something less arranged less handsome old-fashioned as though it were even now as it had been two hundred years ago a survival as the old grey tower in the market-place was a survival for a little while he stood hesitating the passage was dark and he did not wish to plunge into a servant's room strange that up here there was no sound at all an absolute deathly stillness he walked down to the end of the passage then turning came to a door that was larger than the others he could see as he looked at it more closely that there was some faint carving on the woodwork above it he turned the handle entered the room then stopped with a little cry of surprise and pleasure truly meredith had been right here was a room that if there was nothing more to come made the journey sufficiently of value an enchanting room on the left side of it were broad bright windows and at the farther end under the minstrel's gallery windows again there were no curtains to the windows the whole room had an empty deserted air but the more for that reason the place was illuminated with the glow of the evening light the first thing that he realized was the view and what a view the windows were deep set and hung forward it seemed over the hill so that town gardens trees were all lost and you saw only the sea at this hour you seem to swing in space the division lost between sea and sky in the now nearly horizontal rays of the sun only a golden glow covering the blue with a dazzling blaze of colour he stood there drinking it in then sat in one of the window seats his hands clasped lost in happiness after a while he turned back to the room flecks of dust changed into gold by the evening light floated in mid-air the room was disregarded indeed the walls were panelled the little minstrel's gallery was supported on two heavy pillars the floor was bare of carpet and had even a faint waxen sheen as though in spite of the room's general neglect it was used once and again for dances but what pathos the room had he did not know that almost fifteen years before meredith had felt that same thing how vastly now that pathos was increased how greatly since meredith's day the world's history had relentlessly cut away those earlier years he saw that round the platform of the gallery was intricate carving and going forward more closely to examine saw that in every square was set the head of a grinning lion some high-backed quaintly shaped chairs that looked as though they might be of great age were ranged against the wall being now right under the gallery he saw some little wooden steps he climbed up them and then from the gallery shadow looked down across the room how clearly he could picture that old scene something straight from jane austen with miss bates and mrs norris stiff back against the wall and anne elliot and elizabeth bennett mr collins and the rest the fiddler scraping the negus for refreshment the night darkening the carriages with their lights gathering the door at the far end of the room closed with a gentle click he started not imagining that any one would choose that room at such an hour two figures were there in the shadow beyond the end room the light fell on the man's face harkness could see it very clearly the other was a woman wearing a white dress he could not see her face for an instant they were silent then the man said something that harkness could not hear the girl at once broke out no 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 oh please herrick she must be a very young girl the voice was that of a child it had in it a desperate note that held harkness's attention instantly the man said something again very low but if you don't care the girl's voice pleaded then let me go back oh herrick let me go let me go my father does not wish it but i'm not married to your father it is to you my father and i are the same what he says i must do i do but you can't be the same 
Her voice now was trembling in its urgency. No one could love your father more than I do, and yet we are not the same. Nevertheless, you did what your father asked you to do. So must I. But I didn't know. I didn't know. And he didn't know. He has never seen me frightened of anything, and now I am frightened. I've never said I was to anyone before, but now, now... She was crying, softly, terribly, with a terrified crying of real and desperate fear. Harkness had been about to move. He did not, unseen, and his presence unrealized, wish to overhear, but her tears checked him. Although he could not see her, he had detected in her voice a note of pride. He fancied that she would wish anything rather than to be thus seen by a stranger. He stayed where he was. He could see the man's face, thin, white, the nose long-pointed, a dark, almost grotesque shadow. "'Why are you frightened?' "'I don't know. I can't tell. I've never been frightened before.' have i been unkind to you no but you don't love me did i ever pretend to love you didn't you know from the very first that no one in the world matters to me except my father it is of your father that i am afraid these last three days in that terrible house i'm so frightened herrick i want to go home only for a little while just for a week before we go abroad all our plans are made now you know that we are sailing to-morrow evening yes but i could come afterwards forgive me herrick you may do anything to me if i can only go home for just some days you, you may do anything i don't want to do anything hester no one wishes to do you any harm but whatever my father wishes that every one must do it has always been so she seemed to be seized by an absolute frenzy of fear. Harkness could see her white shadow quivering. It appeared to him as though she caught the man by the arm. Her voice came in little breathless, stifled cries, infinitely pitiful to hear. Oh, please, please, Eric, I dare not speak to your father. I don't dare, I don't dare. But you, let me go, oh, let me go, just this once, Herrick, oh, only this once. I'll only be home for a few days, and then I'll come back. Truly, I'll come back. I'll, I'll see Father and Bobby, and, and then I'll come back. They'll be missing me. I know they will, and I'll be going to a foreign country, such a long way, and they'll be wanting me. Bobby's so young, Herrick, only a baby, He's, and he never had anyone do anything for him but me. You should have thought of that before you married me. You cannot leave me now. I won't leave you. I've never broken my word to anyone. I won't break it now. It's only for a few days. How can you be so selfish, Hester, as to want to upset everyone's plans just for a whim of your own? For myself, I don't care. You could go home forever for all I care. I don't want to marry anyone. But what my father wished had to be. She clung to him then, crying again and again between her sobs, Oh, let me go home, let me go home, oh, let me go home. Harkness fancied that the man put his hands on her shoulders. His voice, cold, lifeless, impersonal, crossed the room. That is enough. He is waiting for us downstairs. He will be wondering where we are. The little white shadow seemed to turn to the window towards the limitless expanse of sunlit sea. Then a voice, small, proud, empty of emotion, said, Father wished me. Harkness was once more alone in the room. 13. They had gone, but the girl's fear remained. It was there as truly as the two figures had been, and its reality was stronger than their reality. Harkness had the sense of having been caught, and it was exactly as though now, as he stood alone there in the gallery, staring down into the room, some imp had touched him on the shoulder, crying, Now you're in for it, now you're in for it, the situation has got you now. He was, of course, not in for it at all. 
how many such conversations between human beings were there it simply was that he had happened against his will to overhear a fragment of one of them yes against his will how desperately he wished that he hadn't been there what induced them to choose that room and that time for their secret confidences he felt still in the echo of their voices the effect of their urgency they had chosen that room because there was some one watching their every movement and they had had only a few moments the child for surely she could not be more had almost driven her companion into that two minutes conversation and harkness could realize how desperate she must have been to have taken such a course but after all it was no business of his girls married every day men whom they did not love and although apparently in this case the man also did not love her and they were both of them in evil plight still that too had happened before and nothing very terrible had come of it it was no business of his and yet he did wish all the same that he could get the ring of the girl's voice out of his ears he had never been able to bear the sight sound or even inference of any sort of cruelty to helpless humans or to animals perhaps because he was so frantic a coward himself about physical pain and yet not altogether that he had on several occasions taken risks of pretty savage pain to himself in order to save a horse a beating or a dog a kicking nevertheless those had been spontaneous emotions roused at the instant there was something lingering a sad and tragic echo in the voice that was still with him the very pathos of the room that he was in the lingering of so many old notes that had been rung and rung again notes of anticipation triumph disappointment resignation made this fresh living sound the harder to escape by jupiter the child was frightened that was the final ringing of it upon harkness's heart and soul but he was going to have his life sufficiently full were he to step in and rescue every girl frightened by matrimony rescue no there was no question of rescue it wasn't once again his affair but he did wish that he could just take her hand and tell her not to worry that it would all come right in the end but would it he hadn't at all cared for the fragment of countenance that fellow had shown to him and he had liked still less the tone of his voice cold unfeeling hard poor child and suddenly the thought of his browning's duchess came to him i was the man the duke spoke to i helped the duchess to cast off his yoke too so here's the tale from beginning to end my friend well here was a tale with which he had definitely nothing to do let him remember that he was here in a most beautiful place for a holiday that was his purpose that his intention what were these people to him or he to them nevertheless the voice lingered in his ear and to be rid of it he left the room he stepped carefully down the wooden steps and then at the bottom of them under the dark lee of the gallery he paused he was so foolishly frightened that he could not move a step he waited at last he whispered is there any one there there was no answer he pushed his way out of the shadow his heart drumming against his shirt there was no one there of course there was not in his room once more with his friend strang and the rembrandt donkey to take him home he sat on his bed holding his hands between his knees he was positively afraid of going down to dinner afraid of what afraid of being drawn in drawn into what that was precisely what he did not know but something that ever since his first glimpse of meredith at the reform club had been preparing it was that he saw as he sat there thinking of it that he feared this something that was piling up outside him and with which he had nothing to do at all why should he mind because he had heard a girl say that she was frightened and wanted to go home 
and yet he did mind minded terribly and with increasing violence from every moment that passed the thought of that child without a friend and on the very edge of an experience that might indeed be fatal for her the thought of it was more than he could endure he was clever at escaping things did they only give him a moment's pause but in this case the longer he thought about it the harder it was to escape from it was as though the girl had made her personal appeal to himself but what an old scamp her father must be harkness thought to give her up like this to a man for whom she has no love who doesn't love her why did she do it and what kind of a man is the father-in-law of whom she is so afraid and who dominates his son so absolutely in any case i must go down to dinner i, I must just take what comes yes but his prudence whispered don't meddle in this affair actively it isn't the kind of thing in which you are likely to distinguish yourself no by jove it isn't well then be careful i mean to be then suddenly the girl's voice came sharp and clear damn it i'll do anything i can he cried aloud jumped from the bed and went downstairs fourteen as he went downstairs he felt a tremendous sense of liberation it was as though he had after many hesitations and fears passed through the first room successfully and closed the door behind him now there was the second room to be confronted what he immediately confronted was the garden of the hotel the sun was slowly setting in the west and great amber clouds spreading out in swaths of color ate up the blue the amber flung out arms as though it would embrace the whole world the deep blue ebbed from the sea was pale crystal then from length to length a vast bronze shield the amber receded as though it had done its work and myriads of little flecks of gold ran up into the pale blue white thousands of scattered fragments like coins flung in some godlike largesse the bronze sea was held rigid as though it were truly of metal the town caught the gold and all the windows flashed in the fresh evening light the grass of the lawn seemed to shine with a fresh iridescence the farther hills were coldly dark several people were walking up and down the gravel paths pausing before going in to dinner in the golden haze only those things stood out that were more important for the scene nature as always being more theatrical than any man-contrived theatre the stage being set the principal actor made his entrance a window running to the gravel path caught the level rays of the setting sun a man stepped before this stopping to light a cigarette and then being there stayed like an oriental image staring out into the garden harkness looked casually then looked again then fascinated remained watching he had never before seen such red hair nor so white a face nor so large a stone as the green one that shone in a ring on the finger of his raised hand he was lighting his cigarette it was after this that he fell into rigid immobility and the fire of the match caught the ring until like a great eye it seemed to open wink at harkness and then regard him with a contemptuous stare the man's hair was en brosse, standing straight on end, as loges used to do in the old pre-war by rote ring. It was like loges, a flaming red, short, harsh, instantly arresting. Evening dress, one small black pearl in his shirt, very small feet in shining shoes. There had stuck in Harkness's mind a phrase that he had encountered once in George Moore's description of Verlaine in Memories and Opinions. I shall not forget the glare of the bald prominent forehead, un tete glabra. That was the phrase now, un tete glabra. The forehead glaring like a challenge, the red hair springing from it like something alive of its own independence 
for the rest this interesting figure had a body round short and fat like a ball over his protruding stomach stretched a white waistcoat with three little plain black buttons the colour of his face had an unnatural pallor something theatrical like the clown in pagliacci or again like one of benda's masks yes this was the truer comparison because through the mask the eyes were alive and beautiful dark tender eloquent but spoilt because above them the eyebrows were so faint as to be scarcely visible the mouth in the white of the face was a thin hard red scratch the eyes stared into the garden the body soon became painted into the window behind it the round short limbs the shining shoes the little black pearl in the gleaming shirt harkness from the shadow where he stood looked and looked again then fearing that he might be perceived and his stare be held offensive he moved forward the man saw him and to harkness's surprise stepped forward and spoke to him i beg your pardon he said but do you happen to have a light my cigarette did not catch properly and i've used my last match here was another surprise for harkness the voice was the most beautiful that he had ever heard from man soft exquisitely melodious with an inflection in it of friendliness courtesy and culture that was enchanting absolutely without affectation why yes certainly said harkness he felt for his little gold match-box found it produced a match and guarding it with his hand struck it in the light the other's forehead suddenly sprang up again like a living thing for an instant two of his fingers rested on harkness's hand they seemed to be so soft as to be quite boneless thank you what an exquisite evening yes said harkness this is a very beautiful place yes said the other is it not and this is incidentally the best hotel in england the voice was so beautiful to harkness who was exceedingly sensitive to sound that his only desire was that by some means he should prolong the conversation so that he might indulge himself in the luxury of it i have only just arrived he said i came only an hour ago and it is my first visit is that so then you have a great treat in store for you this is splendid country round here and although every one has been doing their best to spoil it there are still some lovely places trellis is the only town in southern england where the place is still triumphant over modern improvements there was a pause and then the man said uh, will you be here for long i've made no plans harkness replied i wish i could show you around a little i know this country very well there is nothing i enjoy more than showing off some of our beauties but unfortunately i leave for abroad early to-morrow morning harkness thanked him they were soon talking very freely walking up and down the gravel path the exquisite modulation of the man's voice its rhythm gentleness gave harkness such delight that he could listen forever they spoke of foreign countries harkness had travelled much and remembered what he had seen this man had been apparently everywhere suddenly a gong sounded ah there's dinner they paused the stranger said i beg your pardon you tell me that you are american and i know therefore that you are not hampered by ridiculous conventionalities are you alone i am said harkness well then why not dine with us there is myself my son and a charming girl to whom he has lately been married do me that pleasure or if people are a bore to you be quite frank and say so oh i shall be delighted said harkness good my name is crispin harkness is mine they walked in together fifteen he had as they walked into the hall an overwhelming sense that everything that was occurring to him had happened to him before 
and it was only part of this dream conviction that crispin should pause and say here they are waiting for us and lead him up to the girl who half an hour before had been with him in the little gallery he had even a moment of protesting panic crying to the little imp whose voice he had already heard that evening let me out of this i'm not so passive as you fancy it is a holiday i'm here for there is no knight errant to me you've caught the wrong man for that but the girl's face stopped him she was beautiful he had from the first instant of seeing her no doubt of that and it was as though her voice had already built her up for him in that dim room straight and dark her face had childlike purity in its rounded cheeks its large brow and wondering eyes its mouth set now in proud determination but trembling a little behind that pride its cheeks very soft and faintly coloured her hair was piled up as though it were only recently that it had come to that distinction she was wearing a very simple white frock that looked as though it had been made by some little local dressmaker of her own place she had been proud of it delighted with it harkness could be sure perhaps only a week or two ago now experiences were coming to her thick and fast she was clutching them all to her determined to face them whatever they might be finding them as harkness knew from what he had overheard more terrible than she had ever conceived she had been crying as he knew only half an hour ago but now there were no traces of tears only a faint shell-like flush on her cheeks the man standing beside her was not much more than a boy but harkness thought that he had seldom perceived an uglier countenance a large broad nose a long thin face like a hatchet grey colourless eyes and a bony body upon which the evening clothes sat awkwardly here was ugliness itself but the true unpleasantness came from the cold aloofness that lay in the unblinking eyes the hard straight mouth he might be walking in his sleep harkness thought for all the life he's showing what a pair for the girl to be in the hands of harkness was introduced esther my dear this is mr harkness who is going to give us the pleasure of dining with us mr harkness this is my boy herrick the little man led the way and it was interesting to perceive the authoritative dignity with which he moved he had a walk that admirably surmounted the indignities that the short legs and stumpy body would in a less clever performer have inevitably entailed he did not strut nor trot nor push out his stomach and follow it with proud resolve his dignity was real almost regal and yet not absurd he walked slowly looking about him as he went he stopped at the entrance of the dining hall now crowded with people spoke to the head waiter a stout pompous-looking fellow who was at once obsequious and started down the room to a reserved table the diners looked up and watched their progress but harkness noticed that no one smiled when they came to their table in the middle of the room mr crispin objected to it and they were at once shown to another one beside the window and looking out to the sea it will amuse you to see the room hester you sit there you can look out of the window too when you are bored with people will you sit here mr harkness on my right harkness was now opposite the girl and looking out to the sea that was lit with a bronze flame that played on the air like a searchlight the window was slightly open and he could hear the sounds from the town the merry-go-round a harsh trumpet and once and again a bell do you mind that window crispin asked him i think it is rather pleasant you don't mind it hester dear they are having festivities down there this evening the light of their annual ceremony when they dance round the town something as old as the hill on which the town is built i fancy you ought to go down and look at them mr harkness oh, i think i will harkness replied smiling he noticed that now that the man was seated he did not look small 
his neck was thick his shoulders broad that forehead in the brilliantly lit room absolutely gleamed the red hair springing up from it like a challenge the mention of the dance led crispin to talk of other strange customs that he had known in many parts of the world especially in the east yes he had been in the east very often and especially in china the old china was going you would have to hurry up if you were to see it with any colour left it was too bad that the west could not leave the east alone the matter with the west mr harkness is that it always must be improving everything and everybody it can't leave well enough alone it must be thrusting its morals and customs on people who have very nice ones of their own only they are not western that's all we have too many conventional ideas over here suspicious observances that are just as foolish as any in the south seas more foolish indeed now i'm shocking you hester i'm afraid hester he explained to harkness is the daughter of an english country doctor a very fine fellow but she hasn't travelled much yet she only married my son a month ago this is their honeymoon and it is very nice of them to take their old father along with them he appreciates it my dear he raised his glass and bowed to her she smiled very faintly staring at him for an instant with her large brown eyes then looking down at her plate i have been driven crispin explained into the east by my collector's passions as much as anything you know perhaps what it is to be a collector not of anything especial but a collector something in the blood worse than drugs or drink something that only death can cure i don't know whether you care for pretty things mr harkness but i have some pieces of jade and amber that would please you i think i have i think one of the best collections of jade in europe harkness said something polite the trouble with the collector is that he is always so much more deeply interested in his collection than any one else is and he is not so interested in a thing when he owns it as he was when he was wondering whether he could afford it however women like my jade their fingers itch it is pleasant to see them have you ever felt the collector's passion yourself in a tiny way only said harkness i have always loved prints very dearly etchings especially but i have so small and unimportant a collection that i never dream of showing it to anybody i have not the means to make a real collection but if i were a millionaire it is in that direction that i think i would go etchings are so marvellously human unaccountably personal why herrick listen to that mr harkness cares about etchings we must show him some of ours i have a hundred guilders and a de jong that are truly superb do you know my favourite etcher in the world i am sure that you will never guess oh there's a large field to choose from said harkness smiling oh there is indeed but samuel palmer is the man for me you will say that he goes oddly enough with my jade but whenever i travel abroad the bellman and the ruined tower go with me and then le père what a glorious artist and le gros woolly trees and our old friend caillot yes we have an enthusiasm in common there for the first time harkness addressed the girl directly do you also care about etchings mrs crispin she flushed as she answered him i am afraid that i know nothing about them our things at home are not very valuable i am afraid except to us she added she spoke so softly that harkness scarcely caught her words ah but hester will learn crispin said she has a fine taste already it needs only some more experience you are learning already are you not hester yes she answered almost in a whisper then looked up directly at harkness he could not mistake her glance it was an appeal absolutely for help he could see that she was at the end of her control her hand was trembling against the cloth she had been drinking some of her burgundy and he guessed that this was a desperate measure 
he divined that she was urging herself to some act from which during all these weeks she had been shuddering his own heart was beating furiously the food the wine the lights crispin's strange and beautiful voice were accompaniments to some act that he saw now hanging in front of him or rather waiting as a carriage waits into which now of his own free will he is about to step to be whirled to some terrific destination he tried to put purpose into his glance back to her as though he would say let me be of some use to you i'm here for that you can trust me he felt that she knew that she could she might such was her case trust any one at this crisis but she had been watching him he felt sure throughout the meal listening to his voice steadying his movements wondering perhaps whether he too were in this conspiracy against her he had the sudden conviction that on an instant she had resolved that she could trust him and had he had time to do so as was usual with him to step back and regard himself he would have been amazed at his own happiness they had come to the dessert crispin as though he had no purpose in life but to make everyone happy was cracking walnuts for his daughter-in-law and talking about a thousand things there was nothing apparently that he did not know and nothing that he did not wish to hand over to his dear friends it is too bad that i can't show you my hundred guilders he cracked a walnut and his soft boneless fingers seemed suddenly to be endued with an amazing strength but why shouldn't i what are you doing this evening i have no plans said harkness i thought i would go perhaps down to the market and look at the fun yes well uh, let me see but that will fit splendidly we have an engagement for an hour or two to say good-bye to an old friend why not join us here at uh, say half-past ten i have my car here it is only half an hour's drive come out for an hour or two and see my things it will give me so much pleasure to show you what i have i can offer you a good cigar too and some brandy that would please you what do you say harkness looked across at the girl thank you he said gravely i shall be delighted that's splendid very good of you the house also should interest you very old and curious it has a history too i have rented it for the last year i shall be quite sorry to leave it then smiling he leant across what do you say hester shall we have our coffee outside yes thank you she answered with a curious childish inflection as though she were repeating some lesson that was only half remembered she rose and started down the room harkness followed her halfway to the door crispin was stopped for a moment by the head waiter and stayed with his son harkness spoke rapidly there's no time at all but i want you to know that i was in the room at the top of the house just now when you were there i heard everything i apologize for overhearing i could not escape but i want you to know that if there's anything i can do anything in the world i will do it tell me if there is we have only a moment on looking back afterwards he thought it marvellous of her that realizing who was behind them she scarcely turned her head showed no emotion but speaking swiftly answered yes i'm in great trouble desperate trouble i'm sure you are kind there is a thing you can do tell me he urged they were now nearly by the door and the two men were coming up i have a friend i told him that if i would agree to his plan i would send a message to him to-night i did not mean to agree but now i'm not brave enough to go on he is to be at half-past nine at a little hotel the feathered duck on the sea-front any one will tell you where it is his name is dunbar he is young short you can't mistake him he will be waiting there go to him tell him i agree i'll never forget crispin's forehead confronted them what do you say to this here is a sheltered corner dunbar dunbar where had he heard the name before they all sat down
End of Part 1, Section 2part one of portrait of a man with red hair by hugh walpole this librivox recording is in the public domain part one the sea like bronze section one one you're my friend i was the man the duke spoke to i helped the duchess to cast off his yoke too so here's the tale from beginning to end my friend two ours is a great wild country if you climb to our castle's top i don't see where your eye can stop for when you've passed the cornfield country where vineyards leave off flocks are packed and sheep range leads to cattle tract and cattle tract to open chase and open chase to the very base of the mountains where at a funeral pace round about solemn and slow one by one row after row up and up the pine trees grow go like black priests up and so down the other side again to another greater wilder country to another greater wilder country to another greater one the soul of charles percy harkness slipped like a neat white pocket handkerchief out through the carriage window into the silver blue air hung there changing into a tiny white fleck against the immensity struggling for escape above the purple pointed trees of the dark wood then realizing that escape was not yet fluttered back into the carriage again was caught by charles percy neatly folded up and put away the browning lines old-fashioned surely had yielded it a moment's hope those and some other lines from another outmoded book but the place reasserted its spell marshalling once again its army its silver-belted knights its castles of perilous frowning darkness its meadows of gold and silver streams the old spell working the same purpose for how many times and for what intent that we may be reminded yet once again that there is the step behind the door the light beyond the window the rustle on the stair and that it is for these things only that we must watch and wait for harkness had committed the folly of having two books open on his knee a peck at one a peck at another a long eager glance through the window at the summer scene but above all a sensuous state of slumber hovering in the hot scented afternoon air just above him waiting to pounce to pounce first browning then this other the old book in a faded red-brown cover to paradise frederick lester at the bottom of the title page eighteen ninety two how long ago how faded and pathetic the old book was he alone in all the british isles at that moment reading it certainly no other living soul and he had crossed to browning after lester's third page he swung in mid-air the open fields came swimming up to him like vast green waves gently to splash upon his face hanging over him laced about the telegraph poles rising and falling with them the voice of the old man with the long white beard the only occupant of the carriage with him broke sharply in like a steel knife cutting through blotting paper uh, pardon me but there is a spider on your neck harkness started up the two books slipped to the floor he passed his hand damp with the afternoon warmth over his cool neck he hated spiders he shivered his fingers were on the thing with a shudder he flung it out of the window thank you he said blushing very slightly not at all the old man said severely you were almost asleep and in another moment it would have been down your back he was not the old man you would have expected to see in an english first-class carriage save that now in these democratic days you may see any one anywhere but first-class fares are so expensive. Perhaps that is why it is only the really poor who can afford them. 
the old man who was thin and wiry had large shabby boots loose and ancient trousers a flopping garden straw hat his hands were gnarled like the knots of trees he was terribly clean he had blue eyes on his knees was a large basket and from this he ate his massive luncheon here an immense sandwich with pieces of ham like fragments of banners there a colossal apple a monstrous pear going far munched the old man no said harkness blushing again to trellis i change at Turth, i believe we should be there at four thirty should be said the old man dribbling through his pear the train's late another tourist he added suddenly i beg your pardon said harkness another of these damned tourists you are i mean i lived at trellis such as you drove me away i am sorry said harkness smiling faintly i suppose i am that if by tourist you mean somebody who is travelling to a place to see what it is like and enjoy its beauty a friend has told me of it he says it is the most beautiful place in england beauty said the old man licking his fingers a lot you tourists think about beauty with your charabangs and oranges and babies and americans if i had my way i'd make the americans pay a tax spoiling our country as they do i am an american said harkness faintly the old man licked his thumb looked at it and licked it again i wouldn't have thought it he said where's your accent i have lived in this country a great many years off and on he explained and we don't all say i guess every moment as novelists make us do he added smiling smiling yes but how deeply he detested this unfortunate conversation how happy he had been and now this old man with his rudeness and violence had smashed the piece into a thousand fragments but the old man spoke little more he only stared at harkness out of his blue eyes said trellis is too beautiful a place for you it will do you harm and fell instantly asleep two yes harkness thought looking at the rise and fall of the old man's beard it is strange and indeed lamentable how deeply i detest a cross word that is why i am always creeping away from things why too i never make friends not real friends why at thirty-five i am a complete failure that is from the point of view of anything real i am filled too with self-pity he added as he opened to paradise again and groped for page four and self-pity is the most despicable of all the vices he was not unpleasing to the eye as he sat there thinking he was dressed with exceeding neatness but his clothes had something of the effect of chain armour was that partly because his figure was so slight that he could never fill any suit of clothes adequately that might be so his soft white collar his pale blue tie his mild blue eyes his long tranquil fingers these things were all gentle his chin protruded he was called gaunt by undiscerning friends but that was a poor word for him he was too slight